Hey bitches, I'm going to be eating some cereal, some French toast, Look, a little bread, <laughs> okay so I fixed the angle a little bit so you guys can see me eating my food. I remember having this cereal when I was little and they took it off for the longest time and now it's back and I love it. Um, I want to read you guys a uh, creepypasta. So... I do got one right here. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be reading it. Okay. This is called hold on, what is it called? A cabin in the swamp. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um, my brother and I bought the camp in this old man's for a song. It was an old trapper's cabin, set back down a bayou, well off the main lake and back in the swamp. It had no electricity, no water, no modern appliances. It needed some work. I'm reading it on my iPod. Um, a while back, the old man who owned it couldn't manage the taxes and was run off. We only had to pay a small fee in what he owed, which really didn't amount to much. At the time we thought thought it a real we thought it was a real steal. The paperwork was finished on a Wednesday. And my brother and I met and left for yet to sign everything. We loaded a bay to you on Friday afternoon after work and left the launch about supper time for the weekend. It was a hot Louisiana hot, and even as the sun dipped to touch the treetops, the heat was merciless. A. Lee turned the batu north and opened her up. The wind in my face was cooking me thoroughly, and I could feel my skin crisping in the sunset. I looked back on my brother in the stern, his hand on the throttle of my old Evan Rood as it purred and pushed us up the lake. He has our father's ex complex, ple sorry, I can't read, complexion, and was as dark and tan as age suppressed. I am even more like pine, our mother's color, and he he had been after me about sunscreen from the moment we left the truck. A heroine leapt from its perch at the sound of our mo motor and dipped my fingers in the passing water. It was black as good coffee and but for the curls of pale foam unpenetrable to the eye. Alligators are plentiful in this Alamans and this evening was no exception as they cruised the lily pads and marsh grass for supper. Ailey was keeping to the right hand side and every now and then the brown and green of the swamp was broken by the surprising white of an arrogant. I took a deep breath. The air was full of the odor of life and decay of the living and the dead. Maybe half an hour later we sighted the survivor's tape that marked our path. He turned the bayou two up into the bayou, barely slowing his hand sure. Nearly instantly the suppressed and Spanish moss cut the sun leaving us in the humid shade. An alligator slid into the water from its place on the muddy bank among the plumettos. 
I turned the grass, but by the time we were past, there was no sign of the water of his going. I turned back to my brother and smiled. He raised an excited hand, thumb up. We reached the cabin maybe an hour before full dark, and A. Lee slid the bay of two against his weather piling so I could tie us off. A rickety ladder allowed us to climb to the porch, built high to keep the inevitable tidal surge of the hurricane from washing the house away. The invertrude puttered and died, and the chorus of tree frogs and insects swept in to fill the absence. Spiders' webs were stretched from piling to piling, full of shrimp nets were right writhing bugs. Get your ass up there, Joseph, my brother was laughing. We ain't got all day. I grabbed a spare rope, a particularly fat spider scurried away from my hand as I gripped the rope. Ooh. I watched it disappear into a wide crack between two beams. God damn! But you are slow. My brother was impatient at the best of times. I climbed to the porch, letting the line down to A. Lee so that he could pass up our gear. It was all easy enough except for the full cooler of ice and water. And my brother and I struggled mightily to get that up. A. Lee's head was just visible above the deck as I pulled the key from around my neck and unlocked the new padlock with which we had latched the door last week. You gonna open the door or what? He said. I could hear the excitement in his voice. Quiet down, man. Don't make me put you in your place. If you have a brother, you know how the banter goes. I watch him step into the deck and dust his hands on his pants. I like to see that, he laughed, opening the lid of the cooler and tossing me an icy bottle of water. I pushed the door open and stepped into the sweltering heat of the cabin. It was dark and still and all the more uncomfortable for me. That cereal is so good. The cabin wasn't big, 20 by 20 or thereabout, but had a large table and a few serviceable wooden chairs, a bunk and a wood-burning stove. It smelled musty. It smelled like it had been closed for a long time. It smelled like the family vault in Abbeville. I shook the sod off and took a long swallow of water. I could feel the cold coil itself through my guts. A few mosquitoes had already found their way through the open door and were buzzing around my head, despite the lacquer coating of deep woods off. We need to get on that screen, pronto. Ailey nodded and swallowed. Damn, but it's hot, he yelled from the porch. I returned to the deck and grabbed my work belt. He unrolled the screen as I opened the windows and called out the numbers on my tape measure. Ailey cut the screen aside and held it while I hammered a few staples into fasten it flush with the wood. My eyes stung from sweat and I rubbed my wet forearm across my face in a dubious effort to dry them. I turned to draw my belt on the table just as a filthy white filthy white cat walked through the door. Its hair was matted and clumped sturdy with only God knew what. It eyed my brother and me, its lips curling back slightly to expose its teeth. Ailey stomped his foot, finding a leap. The cat hissed and stood its ground. I tried to edge around, putting myself opposite the cat and the door. I hoped to flush the cat out onto the porch, but I had other ideas and rushed past me into the cavern. Where the hell did it go? My brother asked. I turned again. The cavern is a single room. Table, chairs, bunk, and a stove, but no cap. There must be a hole somewhere, I said. Yeah, maybe behind the stove, my brother said, crossing the room to inspect it. With the windows open, there was enough light to see, but the shadows were deep enough to hide a cat. Flashlight. I'm sorry if I'm eating slow. <laughs> it's 
kind of hard to eat and read. And the poor child sent my pack and found my head went. I tossed it to A. Lee and watched as he searched behind the stove. I heard him shake the stove pipe, heard its firm contact with the wall. He shook his head. Nothing. He drew the beam of the head lamp over the bunk and corner in which it lay. The wall was good there, too. Fuck it, then, I said. The cat's gone. Good enough, he replied. The sun was down by the time we had our stuff in the cabin. Ailey lit the propane lantern and set it on the table. I used my pocket knife to cut the tops off. The empty water bottle scooped some ice from the cooler into the makeshift glasses and poured a few fingers of crown, crown oil into each. Ailey smiled and took a sip, smiled again and took my hand. We got ourselves a camp, brother. Brother. <laughs> His eyes twinkled in the lamplight. We dusted off two of the chairs and set them side by side near the table. There was no sense putting the cat back on the bottle, at least not this early in the evening. We sliced cheese and dry sausage, sipped whiskey, and retold the misadventures of our youth. Outside, the frogs were singing their hearts out. The bottle was about half full when we, a conversation turned to, turned to the trapper. I wonder what happened to that old guy, Ailey mused. I could see that he felt sorry for him. Sorry in some sense that the old man had lost the camp the way he had. He was always a fan of underdogs. I don't know, I said. I'm I'm sure he moved on. Ailey freshened his drink. You know what was strange? He looked trouble and his eyes tightened in that way he has when he's thinking. What? I asked. That cat wasn't wet. My brother paused and took another sip of whiskey out here on the bayou. It was my turn to sip and think. Maybe it lives in the suppress, jumps from tree to tree. Maybe, he said. You wishing on a calendar? Yeah, smiling past my cup. That was good. We both knew what that meant. Down here, the little garo is a boogeyman that keeps kids up at night. Supposedly, it's a bit obsessive, compulsive, and stops to count all the little holes before it can. Before it can enter our house at night. The more superstitious have been known to hang a colander or cheese grater by the door for just this reason. Suddenly, A. Lee laughed. Ain't scared for nothing, he said, twisting his voice into his best imitation of a Marksville hillbilly we used to know. I joined him, jumping to my feet. Nothing, I yelled. Just then, the hiss of a cat strangled our laughter. It was long, sharp sound that carried through the walls of the cabin. And something in the tone of that angry wail was almost human. The swamp creature felt it too, and the frogs went silent. Neither of us said a thing for a few seconds. The cat? Ailey nodded. Yeah, I think so. Fuck. Fuck's right, he said. Setting his drink on the table, beads of condensation rolled down the side of the plastic and onto the table. Wish we had a 22, I said. My brother nodded and mimed shooting. Pop, pop. Mimed. A breeze rose and stirred the palmetto leaves into our characteristic growl. The air was thick with humidity and A. Lee's shirt sagged damp. Mine was much the same. I ran the side of my plastic cup across my forehead and the whiskeyed ice numbed my skin in a few seconds. God bless the man who invented the cooler. The frog's voices rose in chorus again, supported by the low growl of the corrugated leaves. Whiskey? I asked. Ailey lifted his cup and I sloshed in a few swallows. He took a sip and sighed. We got ourselves a camp, he said. Another quarter of a bottle of crown later, I threw a sleeping bag over the bunk. Ailey pulled a chair over the bed and secured a mosquito net from one of the exposed roof beams. We'd want that, even with the window screen, until we could do something about the door.
We peel our clothes off and search from across the backs of the chairs. Fuck, it's hot, I said. I took a handful of ice from the cooler and mopped my face with it, relishing the moment momentary cool. My brother grunted in affirmation. Rethinking the generator? Now I am. I flopped into the bunk next to him. Now I am. My dreams were troubled as I baked and turned like a rotisserie chicken. By morning, I was well done. I heard A. Lee rise at dawn as I drove in half sleep. Fuck you, he laughed, shoving the bunk with his foot and startling me away. What? You know what, asshole? No, really. I said, wiping my eyes and yawning, I sat up. The table, he said. What about it? His mouth twisted for a second. And his eyes narrow. Come see, he said. I rolled out of the bunk around my feet and joined him in the center of the table. Cut into the boards and rough letters were two words. Get out. <coughs> my pocket knife was open, stuck point first just above the teeth. You're telling me you didn't do this? My brother said, looking me in the eye. I could tell by his tone that he wasn't kidding around. I shook my head. No. A. Lee nodded and pulled my knife from the wood, folded it closed, and handed it to me. Don't leave it out again, he said. I was spooked. My brother was spooked. Hell, who wouldn't have been? Folks down here have more truck with the weird. That's a simple fact. From voodoo to hoodoo, from Lucaro to... Treachery, treachery, we're immersed in the strange. Some tread water, some dip their feet in. Hell, a few dive deep. But it's like the heat south of I-10. They're just getting away from it. Maybe that's why, spooked or not, we wordlessly gathered out rods and tackle. Our off and on screen fished a few nearly frozen Starbucks can espressos out of the cooler and started the bay to into the patch of a swamp that never really became ours that Wednesday. When A. Lee and I signed our names in bold blue ink at the realtor's office in Lafayette, the suppressed knees rose from the black water like the lower teeth of some great monster. Here and there, small lagoons of lily and still black water broke the swamp. A. Lee cut the enverude enver Cut the ember root at the most promising and set a sparkling white rooster tail in a long, slow arc to land next to stump with a soft plop. Within seconds, he had a strike and seconds later, a fat sacculop was wriggling in the bottom of the bay of two. The sunset fingers through the suppress that fell on the water, the lilies in us, a bright blue dragonfly, iridescent in the sun settled on the bow next to me still as stone I watched it for a few seconds between cast the fish were biting and I made a stringer from a length of bank line and a few fresh twigs out from a lower branch it was soon heavy for my struggling dinner I was feeling better and so was Ailey we got a mess of fish I said Ailey smiled you want to clean from here or back at the camp? Fresh fish guts in the water couldn't hurt the fish any, so I decided to do it now. Out came the pocket knives and off went the scales. Bellies were slit, entrails pulled, and A. Lee always meticulous scraped the back of their cavities to move any sign of the bitter innards. As we worked, we rinsed our cat catch in the swamp water, and every so often a flash of silver White told me that a cannibal was feasting just above the surface. My brother fired up the motor, spun us neatly around, and brought us back to the camp. I took the stringer of fish and climbed the ladder. My head was even with the planks of the deck when I saw it. The white cat stood just by the door in the dark of the cabin. 
We have forgotten to close and lock the door. It hits the warning of me along pale teeth, bare to the gum. Shoo! I yell, scat! The cat hissed again and turned slowly, watching me with its green eyes as it slunk farther into the cabin. I dropped the fish on the deck and pulled myself up. The cat! Ailey asked. Yeah? Fuck him. I could tell the spook was back on him. In truth, the hairs on my neck were straight and stiff. I don't know, Ailey. I began. Maybe we should just go. Fuck that, he said. This is our camp. The cat hissed from somewhere in the cabin. Ours? Ailey called from the ladder. Oh, ours! Ailey called from the ladder. I dug through our gear for a skillet and a bag of fish fry. From the porch, I watched my brother unscrew the lantern from the propane tank and replace it with a small camp stove. Joseph, you gonna help or what? He asked. His mind was set and like an anchor, Cammy failing farther into the spook. It was an effort, but I made my legs move and managed to cross the threshold. I was picking the last bits of flesh from my bones when Ailey poured the whiskey. I nibbled the tail, fried hard and crisp, and took a long, slow slip sip of cold crumb. Ailey, I asked, yeah, we gotta do something. We ain't gotta do nothing but have a good time, he said. He touched his plastic to mine as he expected the fine ring of crystal. Drink up and I'll pour another. Maybe we should talk to Richard, I said, saying his name like we do. Richard. He knows about things like this. Nobody knows about things like this. Hell, this ain't even a thing. Just some fucking cat in an old cabin. Okay, I'm looking at this story and it's like really long. So, maybe I'll make a really long video. Um, neither of us mentioned the table. It couldn't bear mentioning, if you know what I mean. I noticed clearly for the first time that my brother had covered the carved words with a cutting board. Ailey sensed my fear. It's just a cat in a cabin, Joseph. Drink up. I did. Emptying my cup in slow swallows, Ailey poured more whiskey over the ice. We may have to make a run for more crown, he said, forcing a laugh. Don't want to run dry. He sloshed the fat last few fingers in the bottle for Emphius and then caught my eye. Our camp, he said, ours. Ours. The hairs on my arms prickled in despite. Despite the heat. I shivered. Behind my brother, a dark shadow hung suspended from a ceiling beam. A man on a rope, his feet swinging inches from the floor. What? Elias, what's up? I could feel the blood leave my face and point at Ailey turn and the shadow was gone. But it hadn't been my imagination. I was sure of it. The rope. I knew it was a rope. A hanged man. The trapper. Ailey! I said. My words a, sh a whisper. Fuck that, he said, taking another long sip of whiskey. And fuck you. He wasn't talking to me. My brother is a stubborn man, and he will have his way. Come hell or high water, we didn't deem it go run for more crumb. It's on the bayou again, Spanish moss dancing in the wind. Clouds were building, and the sky was a blue-gray tingle with black and purple. The lake was already rough, and the wind was teasing the waves into small crest. Storm's coming, I said as we pushed off the pier. My brother nodded. We needed to get up the lake in a hurry for wrist swamping and he opened the throttle, and the Enverood roared into action. This time I sat and sterned near him to avoid most of the spray, and we took turns sipping from the bottle, swallowing whiskey like it was medicine, which I suppose in a way it was. It was grim, reverly, and our mood was as dark as the sky. 
our camp, Ailey said. Ours. It didn't feel like that, though. Blue ink and laundry's reality, real, reality or not. By the time we reached the shelter of the bayou, the lake was high and passable for a small boat. But here, the closed trees and swamp sheltered the water, and though the suppress were cutting a rug above us, the bayou's black water was as still as the grave. A. Lee raced the storm and the swamp went past. There was an excitement to it, an anxious, fearful energy crackling before the storm. Lightning peeled overhead and the sky opened up, spilling rain in great drenching sheets. The cabin came into view as we rounded the last bend and my brother waited to release the throttle. Sliding us between the pilings and under the camp, I battered webs away with that terrible feeling you get when you just know a spider's on you, when the silk's in your face. Ailey was having none of it and seized the piling, bringing the bay or two to a stop. I felt stupid and childish. I stopped fighting the spiders and tied us off. We had bought some more ice for the cooler at Lucky's, and Ailey threw the bags over his shoulder and climbed the ladder without a word. I grabbed the bottle and followed him up. We both paused after I unlocked the door, rain streaming down our faces, shirts plastered to our skin with water. My brother broke our paralysis, giving the old wood a push with his foot. I looked and I'm sure he did too, though he made an effort at nonchalance. The cabin as we had left it. I could breathe. In we went, the wind now howling in the trees. The rain beat the roof in a steady drumming, revealing copious leaks. Ailey had the lantern going shortly. The cloud dim sky was giving much light. I cracked the ice on the floor a few times to break it up, tore the bags open, and spilled it loudly into the cooler. My brother scooped our plastic cups full and poured a hefty measure of crown into each of them. He pulled up a chair and stirred his drink with one of his meaty fingers. The storm was raging across the swamp. Do you remember Erwin's doll? He asked, still spinning the ice. Oh yeah, I said. Our Aunt Arlene had an old doll with a porcelain, porcelain face that she kept in a chair in her bedroom. Its painted features were weathered and worn. Its glassy eyes, terrible and deep. It had a pull string on his back. But we never dared to string on its back. But we never dared to discover what it might say. We used to dare each other to pull it, but neither of us ever had the nerve. It's like that, he said, taking a sip. Just like that. What do you mean? This cabin, it's spooky, but it ain't gonna hurt us none. I considered that as I swallowed a mouthful of crown. We never pulled that string, but here we were pulling on something that felt far worse. I suppose, I said, but Ailey is my older brother, even as a grown man. If he says so, I had faith. Old school, kneeling on pine plank faith. This is our camp, he said, tapping the table for emphasis. And I aim to enjoy it. Our camp. I needed to piss something fierce, which is not a good sign when whiskey has been your only beverage. I made my way to half open door and wet as I was already, stepped onto the deck to pee off the edge. Our camp. Lightning flashed bright against the dark sky and thunder hurt my ears and set my head pounding. I turned to see Ailey that lightning had been close. What I saw froze my mouth, and it was as if my heart struggled against a firm grip, one crippled sideways thumping beat at a time. There was a man behind him on the other side of the table, an old man in raggedy clothes. He had long white hair, but what struck me, what me most was the coil noose around his neck and the dangling rope lost beneath the shadows of the table. The trapper, his camp. I tried to call out, my mouth open, but no sound slipped out. Get out! Get out! roared the old man, his voice like a storm wind. The door slammed shut. Loud as a thunderclap had been, Ailey was inside his camp. I felt a cold hand on my neck, and I was 
fail, falling 15 long feet to the bay. I hit flat and hard, hit the slap of the warm water, felt the embrace of its black arm sinking, sinking. I tried to kick, but something had me, something cold as the ice in our cooler. It was pulling me down and down, deeper into the muddy water. I was going to die right here, right then. But then I thought of A. Lee in the cabin, his cabin, behind that closed door. I couldn't leave him, not like that, not in this cabin. I kicked viciously and worked my arms like mad. Whatever it was, let, whatever it was, let me go. And I rocketed to the surface, my head breaking water in the rain. A few strokes had me to the ladder, and I pulled myself onto the lowest rung and climbed for all I was worth. I am not a small man, and I hit the door like a hurricane. It held, I backed up, and I hit it again. It resisted for an instant and then swung open, spilling me to the floor. Lightning flashed. The propane la lamp was dead. Ailey was on the floor. I grabbed my brother by his leg and heaved him across the floor to the deck. In the dim storm light, suppressed whipping in the wind, I locked down on my brother's open eyes and dead pale face. He can't be dead. He can't be dead. He can't be dead. He can't be dead. Lee! I yelled over the storm. Lee! I slapped him hard. He choked and sputtered, and I drew a loud halting breath. Joseph? He asked. Yeah, it's Joseph. I curled his head in my hands. I got you, brother. He had to close his eyes from the rain. Joseph? I slung Ailey across my shoulder and tried to stand. My legs burnt with the effort, and my bad knee gave a sickening pop. But I got to my feet and staggered to the ladder. I'm not I'm not sure how I managed to get us both down, but I did. I let my brother into the bayou too as gently as I could, and tied us and got the inroad going. It put it to life and I gave it gas. I bounced the bow off a piling, got us clear and launched us out into the rain. I swung the tiller hard and had the motor roaring, thunder peeling into the bayou toward the lake. I risked one look back. I wish I hadn't. There in the doorway was the trapper. His rope whipping in the storm like a lash. His mouth was moving, and though I couldn't hear him over the engine, I knew what he said. Get out! We spent a long, wet night in I could find, but I knew we couldn't risk the lake in this weather. The wind and the rain beat the swamp all night. But at least it kept the worst of the mosquitoes at bay. Ailey soon regained his senses, roused almost as if from sleep, and sat up in the bio too. Joseph? Yali? It's all right. We're good. That seemed to satisfy him. We sat there in the dark, huddled in the bio too, still first light. Needless to say, we didn't go back to the camp. When it was light enough to see, I started up the Enverood and took us to the launch. It was a long, silent drive home. We've never been back to the camp. His camp. I don't expect we will. You can believe whatever you want. That I was drunk and fell from the porch. That my imagination conjured the trapper. That a gust of wind shut the door and that lightning struck a bit too close to A. Lee that night. But I know what I believe. I know what's true. On paper, we still own that cabin. By law, it's ours. But it's not. It never will be. It is his. And it will be till the whole thing slips beneath that thick black water and is washed away in the storm. Maybe even after that. Okay. Um, I'm done. This was a really long video. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to make it long, but the story was long. But if you guys like that video, thumbs it up. Um, I know I didn't really eat that much. Only ate cereal. But anyways, if you liked it, thumbs it up. Um, like for more creepypastas. Um, 
or more stories in my hometown, comment down below if you want more. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.